Greetings of peace. Welcome to The Dean Show, another exciting show. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe right now. How would you like to meet, if you would, were able to, if you had the opportunity, one of the founding fathers, his, one of the children, uh, great-grandfathers, let's say you had a friend whose great-grandfather was one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence of this country, for example. But my next guess, his grandfather was one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence for the State of Israel, and his father was a general for the Israeli army. And we're going to be talking about his book, The General Son, here on The Dean Show. We've heard a lot of myths of Santa Claus, the Tooth Bunny, but these are some great myths that he's going to be dispelling here on The Dean Show with my next guest, Miko Pillet. Don't go anywhere. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. Peace. How are you, Miko Pillet? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Greetings of peace. Thank you for being with us here on the Dean Show. Pleasure. Peace activist. You're the author of The General Son. Yes. And I made it, you know, many people, they would love to meet one of the uh, founding fathers, someone who's connected to them. But your grandfather was the founding, uh, one of the founding fathers of the state of Israel. Yes, he was. Tell us about this. Yes, he was. The generation of my grandparents uh, was the generation of um, the first Jews to uh, take on Zionism um, as an ideology and um, take on this idea of establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Um, and he was very active. Um, he became a leader within the movement. He was a member of the de facto Jewish government before the State of Israel was established. And he was one of the signers on the Declaration of Independence when the State of Israel was established. So that would be that you can make a contrast like let's say he was like the Abraham Lincoln or the no, no, I'm, I'm sorry I'm sorry before George before Washington that, I'm sorry that, about that like a George Washington yes, yes yes okay and then from there your father actually he was the general my father was yes my father was my, both my parents were born in Palestine so they were the first generation Israelis if you will first generation Jews who were born there um, and my father as a young man while still in high school joined the a Zionist militia. He became an officer. So in, in the war of 1948, uh, when the Zionists occupied uh, most of Palestine, he was an officer already. And then he remained in the military as a career officer. And by 1967, he was already a general mm -hmm. and, and a member of the Israeli Central Command, the High Command. Now, something happened in your life, something very sad and tragic, that your niece, she was killed by a suicide bomber. Is that right? That's right. Now, you didn't go off and start to just blindly hate everybody because, I mean, we know that this is something despicable. This is something that is horrific. And many people, they would just end up, you know, hating a, a, a whole community, a whole race because of this. And we see this, you know, uh, happening. But you did something different. Well, to begin with, the people who killed my niece killed themselves as well. So there's nobody to hate. Mm -hmm. Even if I was inclined to hate. Um, the inspiration to do what I did actually came from my sister, my niece's mother. Um, because after this happened and after the funeral, the usual questions that come up have to do with uh, revenge and retaliation and, and, and catching who's responsible and so forth. Um, and then hating a community. This is what's, what's somehow expected for some reason. Well, my sister came out when she came out and started talking to people and answering questions because there was a lot of press, it was big news in Israel. In fact, there was big news everywhere and a lot in, all over the world because she was a granddaughter of a famous general. Um, and my sister said, first of all, don't talk to me about killing more people. The idea of, of killing people in response to somebody's death is despicable. And no real mother would want to see this happen to another mother. 
In terms of a responsible, both she and her husband said, we hold the Israeli government responsible for our daughter's death because when you maintain such a brutal oppression and a brutal occupation against another nation, when you take away people's land and you destroy their homes, when you incarcerate their fathers and quite often their mothers, uh, when you shoot their brothers and sisters in, the, in their school, in the schoolyards, this is what we get. This is the price that you pay as, as, a, as a society that maintains such a brutal oppression and occupation against another people. There's a price to be paid, and this is the price that we pay, and therefore they both felt um, that uh, they both held the Israeli government responsible because the Israeli government is responsible for the reality that exists there. Now, someone just said that's an anti-Semitic statement you just made. Somebody's pointing the finger and say, this guy's anti-Semitic. What do you have to say about that? Well, I'm Jewish, so being anti-Semitic is nonsense. Number <laughs> yeah. one. Number two, being anti-Semitic means being racist against Jews. I'm not racist against Jews. Um, but I am critical of the state of Israel. I'm critical of Zionism, which has really nothing to do with Jews, um, although they claim to. So there's nothing anti-Semitic about criticizing Israel. In fact, most Jews don't even live there. Uh, most Jews never accepted Zionism. So I don't think there's th th that has anything to do with it. And it's a claim that's being thrown out when there's nothing else to say. When the other side, the pro-Israeli side, the side that supports the violence in Palestine uh, has nothing to say, they say anti-Semitic. Well, so they say anti-Semitic. What if uh, someone says, look, you, he's just a self-hating Jew. Have you heard this statement? Yeah, well, I certainly don't hate myself. <laughs> so that's nonsense. <laughs> yeah. And I don't hate anybody else. I think it's, again, it's one of those things they throw at you when, they, when they've got no argument. Yeah. Uh, what else? We're going to be getting into some of the top myths that are surrounded. I have actually, I was telling you, I have a, a student of mine who's a good friend of mine. Uh, hopefully he'll watch this show. And we've gotten into, you know, um, this uh, talk uh, a few times. And usually, uh, because any, this is, this is a human thing. You know, when you see children who are just being killed, right? And um, indiscriminately, and then people will make arguments like, look, this, this, we're just, we're, being, we're the ones being terrorized, you know, that, you know, we have to defend ourselves, right? Uh, this land, we came there, and now they're trying to force us into the ocean. Uh, so what, what do you say when you hear things like this? Well, it's a complete distortion of the, of the history and a complete distortion of reality. The only reason there is a Palestinian resistance is because the Palestinians were thrown out of their land, Palestine was occupied, and Palestinians live under a brutal regime uh, which is very similar to the apartheid regime that, that used to exist in South Africa. Therefore, there is resistance. If, there was, if that didn't exist, if there was no occupation of Palestine, if Israel did not violently kill and oppress Palestinians, there would be no Palestinian resistance. So you can't blame the victim for resisting. You have to look at what started the conflict. You have to look at the oppressor. You have to look at the stronger power and the responsibility lies in their hand. I just had a, a, a rabbi um, give me an analogy. He said, look, imagine you left your home and then someone came and occupied it and then you try to get it back and then they went to the judge. Have you heard some of these analogies? Maybe you can... You can yeah, you know, I, that's assuming that, you know, that's, that's, that's taking it into a place which I, I don't usually go. That's making the assumption that today's Jews are really the descendants of the ancient Hebrews that used to live in that part of the world some 3,000 years ago. That's a that's a, that's a bit of a stretch for me. Um, mm -hmm. And even if it was true, I don't think it, uh, I, I agree with him. It doesn't justify, you know, I did not live there 3,000 years ago. My grandparents immigrated from, from, from Ukraine. Their parents, their grandparents didn't live there. And I don't know any Jew that can trace his or her ancestors back to the ancient Hebrews. So that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of myth there. Um, and I don't think it's relevant. The point is, the Zionist movement was a colonialist movement. It was brutally oppressive. And um, that, is the, the, that is why we have a problem, and that is why there's no peace in Palestine. Uh, we're going to continue. That's one of the myths, that the land was uninhabited. There was no people there. Yeah. So if there's no people there, it's not being uh, used. Why can't we use it? So this is one of the myths that we're going to be clearing up here on The Dean Show with the general son, Miko Pillet. Don't go anywhere. This is really quite bizarre because... All it takes is a little bit of reading of history to find out that this just isn't true. There is no congenital historical enmity between the Arabs and the Jews. The mainstream Israeli Jewish society believed, because that's the way they had been educated, that Palestine was empty, had been empty when the Jewish settlers came there. 
Is it really true that Israel was a land without a people for a people without a land? Palestine was not empty. It was a land populated by Arabs who had a high level of culture, high level of education. With farms and markets and towns and villages and roads and commerce and lots of interaction with the rest of the world. The population was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly Arab. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. Back here on The Dean Show with the General's son. Grandfather was one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence. And 25 years black belt karate? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we got some uh, else in common there. Yeah. Tell, okay, so uh, they say, people will say that, okay, look, nobody was living there. It was just barren land, nobody's there, it's uninhabited. What do we, what, what, uh, is this true or not? Well, if nobody was living there, then, then how is it that close to a million people were forced out in 1948? Were, those people came from the moon or something? There were people living there, and they were forced out in, 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 in what Israel calls a war of independence, I think more, more accurately is called the campaign of ethnic cleansing and terrorism that forced Palestinians out of their homes and uh, out of their land and into refugee camps, mostly, and which is why today we have over 4 million Palestinians living in, in, in horrific conditions in refugee camps, both in Palestine, sometimes minutes away from their land, and in other countries around, around Palestine. Um, all you have to do, I mean, look at pictures, listen to stories. I mean, the Palestinians were there. They were always referred to as a people. Uh, to say that there were no people there is just complete ignorance. Are you saying that also the textbooks, many people, they grow up as kids reading, you know, the history books. Are the history books tainted? Absolutely. Um, there's a book that came out. My, my sister, Narit, is, is, is a um, professor at the Hebrew University. She's an educator. And she published a book about two years ago called uh, Palestine and Israeli School Books. Um, and the question she asked was, how is it that Israeli children who grow up in what seems to be a liberal de democratic society, when they're 18, they put on a uniform and they become monsters. And they suddenly uh, are capable of, of, of terrible atrocities against the Palestinians. So she decided to take a look at the Israeli school books, the Israeli textbooks, and she took some time off and she did some serious research into the schools that are being taught in Israeli high schools. And she found clearly that the Israeli education system is tainted and racist. Racist? Completely racist. And it follows the models of other racist colonialist societies. Give us an example. Well, the way Palestinians are portrayed in, in the textbooks, are they're either portrayed as non-existent, as some kind of a problem like poverty or as terrorists. There is not a single portrayal of a Palestinian as a human being. The maps, the way the maps are portrayed in Israeli geography, uh, in, the, in the geography books, it's always the map of the entire country with no recognition of Palestinian cities or towns or population. Palestinians are like a non-entity. There are Jews and there are others, and the others are not really marked. So Israeli children grow, growing up, what all they know about Palestinians is that they're either some kind of a environmental problem poor and filthy, or terrorists. This is the only frame of reference that they have, even though it's a very small country, and, and everywhere Israelis live is no more than a 10-minute drive from a Palestinian community. But that's the other problem, which is that it's a very segregated country. Israel segregated it uh, in a very effective way, so Israelis never meet Palestinians. You know, I grew up in Jerusalem. I was born and raised in Jerusalem. And most of my life, it was completely occupied. It was supposedly a mixed city. I never met a Palestinian until I moved to the United States. I never sat and talked to Palestinians until I was living in the United States. I was never with a Palestinian where the laws that applied to my life and the laws that applied to their life was the, were the same laws until I moved to the United States because back in Palestine, Israel, that reality does not exist. Um, and so this is how Israelis are, are, are raised to view Palestinians. And at the age of 18, they're given a gun and say, these are enemies, they're trying to kill us, they're trying to push us into the ocean. And there's no mention at all of what the Zionists did in 1948, how they committed these terrible crimes against the Palestinians. Apartheid. We know this was an evil thing in South Africa. And many people can relate to the back of the bus now in this country. When they say, look, you got to get to the back of the bus. 
are we seeing the same thing? Apartheid kind of get to the back of the bus happening in this neck of the woods? It's apartheid for sure. It's not so much get to the back of the bus type of apartheid. It's more legal. And so there's, there's real segregation in the communities. So we rarely take the same buses. Um, but the laws that govern the lives of Palestinians are completely different than the laws that govern the lives of someone like me, an Israeli Jew. For an Israeli Jew like myself, I come and go as I please. It's a liberal democracy. I can speak my mind. I can, you know, I mean, it's a, I, can, I, I, can, I, can, I can sell my house. I can buy a house. I can get a job. I mean, it's a completely free society, a free country for me. Palestinians live in one of three different legal categories. They either live under a brutal military regime in parts of the country, or they live as alien residents, particularly in Jerusalem. Um, and if they're away for a certain amount of time, or if they end up moving and having a citizenship in another country, then that is, being, that is revoked from them. They have no right to return. And then you have the Palestinians who live, and they actually have some kind of an Israeli citizenship, and they live under a set of laws civil laws that discriminate against them specifically. And this was set up as soon as the State of Israel was established, this, this set of a, this apartheid regime, which is really when you have different laws for different people, this apartheid regime was set up immediately as soon as the State of Israel was established, separating Jews from non-Jews. Um, so that is definitely an apartheid regime, and it's definitely a racist regime, and it's definitely uh, 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 an unjustifiable, inexcusable injustice. So you didn't say there is get to the back of the bus, but a totally different bus. It's a totally different bus, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, in other words, the reality is different, so it's not the get back of the yeah. bus, but it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's much deeper, and it's a much more complex legal, uh, yeah. legal reality that exists there. Open air prison. Prison. We've heard that this is the yeah. biggest. Op what, what, what does that mean? Well, you take a place like uh, the Gaza Strip, which is about, I don't know, uh, 140 square kilometers or something. You know, it's a very small place with almost 2 million people living there. They've been under siege for years. Nobody can come or go. Uh, nobody can trade. Nobody, they, can't, they, can, they can go out to fish because Gaza is on the coast only about three kilometers out or three to five kilometers out, depending on the mood of the army. Um, you've got almost two million people living in an open air prison. Mm -hmm. When you, people can't come or go, when people cannot do commerce, when there are no means of, of, uh, of, of, of trade, no means of, of, of life, you've got the Israeli army bombing them on a regular basis. They cannot build after things are being dis destroyed there. They can't, they have no airport, they can't fly out, they can't take a boat out, they can't drive out, they can't walk out. That's an open-air prison. But what if someone says, look, because if we don't do that, then they're going to kill us. Then they're going to end up, you know, getting weapons, and they're going to come attack us. What do you say to that? I say it's nonsense. Uh, if the, 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 there's, there's absolutely no proof to, to substantiate that claim whatsoever. Is that why they do it, though? No, they do it because they want to keep, they want to keep Palestinians segregated from Israel, and they have nothing else to do. They don't know what to do with the Palestinians mm -hmm. in Gaza. Israel created a massive problem, and it doesn't know how to deal with it. The only way it knows how to deal with it is with violence. We're going to take a break and come back with more of the General Sun here on The Dean Show. Don't go anywhere. But what was created in practice was institutional discrimination against non-Jews. In other words, Israel ended up being built on a blueprint of exclusion the Israeli government wants maximum land and resources for Jews, but not the Palestinians living there. That's why, inside Israel, Jews get special privileges, including rights to land and housing, that are denied to the Palestinian citizens, who make up 20% of Israel's population. In the West Bank, Israeli Jewish settlers and Palestinians live on the same land, but must live under two completely separate and unequal systems of Israeli law. The Jewish settlers dominate the natural resources, including water and agricultural land, and they're backed by the Israeli army. To maintain the occupation, Israel has demolished thousands of Palestinian homes and orchards, confiscated Palestinian land, bombed a captive civilian population in Gaza, and punished resistance with raids, arrests, and assassinations, all to gain maximum land while making life so difficult for Palestinians that they will either leave or be too afraid to resist.
please subscribe to The D Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The D Show by making a donation in the link below. Back here on The Dean Show with the grandson of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence for Israel. Your grandfather was, you were born in Israel. Your father was a general in the Israeli army. You know the facts, not the fiction. I compared that, you know, we hear a lot of different, you know, growing up fairy tales and myths. And this is a great myth, you know. Uh, one of them we cleared up that the land was inhabited and um, nobody was there. You cleared that up. And, and the, what's on the ground now? We also hear many things like uh, the media and many of politicians, they'll say that, look, that the Palestinians, if they did have an upper hand, they would do a Holocaust like the Nazis did. What would you say to that? Well, we don't know what would happen if, but we do know what actually took place. And what actually took place is the opposite. What actually took, took place is a, is, is, a, is a massive campaign of ethnic cleansing and a slow, slow genocide by the Israeli forces of the Palestinians. There's been a constant attempt to destroy the Palestinian people, to kick them out of their land and, and, and kill them in, in, in a whole variety of different ways. The latest assault that we saw at Gaza this last summer during Ramadan, uh, Israel murdered in cold blood over 2,000 people on prime time uh, with weapons that are bought, that are sold by, from America or by America to Israel, money that is given to Israel from America, in other words, our taxpayer dollars, we're all part of this, we're all complicit in a way unless we stand up against it. Uh, and this ridiculous claim that there's somehow some kind of a threat to Israel's security from Gaza. Well, Gaza is mostly refugees. The Gaza Strip was established by Israel in the early 1950s as a place to house the thousands and thousands of, of Palestinians who were thrown out of their homes and became refugees as a result of the establishment of the State of Israel. And now there's a problem. Now we've got this, this area called the Gaza Strip, very crowded, and nobody knows what to do. The right thing to do would be to allow the refugees to return. To, to compensate them, to, to pay restitution, and to allow them to return to their homes as they should, as was done in other places in history, I mean, not in Palestine. Uh, but Israel doesn't know what to do. The Israelis look at Gaza, and they see the results of this original crime of the establishment of the Zionist state, of the state of Israel. Now, the only other solution that exists, if, if they're not going to solve a problem, is to attack and then blame the Palestinians. So that's what they do. We know there's been, never been an army in Gaza. There's never been a tank in Gaza. There's never been a warplane or a warship in Gaza. There's never been a military threat from Gaza. There have been attempts at, at armed resistance. So we see the Qassam rockets, uh, which have harmed hardly no one. We, see, we used to see from time to time smaller groups of guerrilla fighters trying to sabotage or, or, or cause some, some damage. But they've never been able to really pose a threat, yet they are bombarded and attacked on a regular basis. So what Israel is very good at, and Israel allies, Israeli, Israel's allies are very good at, is distorting the story, is attacking the victim and then blaming the victim for starting the violence, which of course is complete nonsense. It's like somebody, uh, I mean, it's been compared to someone just being raped and accepting, expecting that person not to, you know... And then blaming the person then, for fighting back. Yeah. Yes. Uh, talk to us about the children. You mentioned 2,000 innocent civilians were killed. Yeah, more than 2,000. And, and many of them, majority, were children. Is that right? Many, not majority, but many were children. Ma yes. ma many, yeah. were, many were yeah. children. Yeah. Talk to us about the, um, the, the, the uh, water situation, the food, and the living. Uh, well, in, in an agreement that was, that, that was sealed by Israel, the U.S., and Egypt, Gaza Strip has been under a severe siege. So there's already a severe shortage in water fit for drinking, nutrition and medicine. This is besides the attack. This is, was on a regular basis. On top of that, on a regular basis, Israel has been attacking Gaza for years now, for decades actually. Well, and we see now, for example, there have been heavy rains and so the place is flooded. So the UN is calling it a disaster area once again and you wonder why isn't Israel fixing this? Israel has a lot of money. Gaza is right there. Israel has all the facilities, the medical facilities, the engineering capability. It's a modern state. And it's allowing this catastrophe to continue. Now you talk about children. We cry for the children and all the civilians that, that were murdered by Israel. Um, but think of the ones who have not been killed. Think of, think, of, think of the ones that have been orphaned, the ones that, are in, that, are in, uh, that have been injured severely and have no family. They have no access to the perfectly modern medical facilities that exist in Israel, sometimes minutes away 
not even a flight away, minutes by car away, but they have no access to these. So they are now in, in orphaned, quite often, injured, severely injured, physically and psychologically, and nobody cares. They're just, they're just left alone. They're just left to be, you know. Um, and this is a crime on top of a crime. The few children that are allowed, are permitted somehow to go into Israeli hospitals, somebody has to pay for. Israel charges them in order to take care of them. It's this absurd reality that it's almost hard to believe it is so horrific. Um, but there we have it. And like I said, it was done in prime time. Everybody saw this. Americans are paying for this, not only in money, but also in arms. America supports this uh, and keeps you know, repeating this mantra that somehow Palestinians are, uh, have, uh, Israel has a right to defend itself against the Palestinians, though Palestinians have never posed a threat. Um, and this is, this is a horrifying reality that has to be, has, you know, has to be stopped. Uh, the, we see a lot of the um, bulldozing of, of homes. Uh, did you know Rachel uh, Corey? Uh, she was also a peace activist. She was mm -hmm. killed, right? Yeah. Protesting. Can you tell us uh, what's going on? Over, over, was it 25,000 homes have been demolished? And why is this going on? Well, Israel, is, Israel has been demolishing Palestinian homes you know, for decades. This is nothing new. Demolishing Palestinian homes either in order to take the land or in order to allow the army a freedom of movement, especially in the Gaza Strip where, 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 there's such a, where, where the population density is so high. Um, the Israeli army goes there all the time and, 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 uh, and, and does operations and so forth. And so it's much easier if you don't have homes to go in and operate and do what you need to do for the tanks and so forth. Uh, Rachel Corey stood in front of bulldozers that were trying to destroy a home, and she was just run over. This is uh, going back quite a few years now. Uh, of course, I know her parents, and, 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 and they're great activists and, and, and spokespeople for the Palestinian cause. Um, but, but there's nothing new about this. In other words, all these different issues that we are talking about today are part of a greater problem. None of these issues can be resolved on its own unless the entire thing is resolved. And that's why it's so important to undo the myths and to connect everything back to what happened in 1948 when the State of Israel was established and recognize that all of Palestine is occupied and is now called Israel. The entire State of Israel is occupied land. All the Israeli cities and towns that were built are illegal settlements. And there has to be a movement similar to the movement that existed in South Africa to replace this very brutal, racist, colonialist regime called the State of Israel with a democracy where Israelis, who are now you know, part, of the, part, part of the reality there, and Palestinians can live together as equals in peace. Yeah, so I know this was a short segment. Um, there's a lot more to cover. Uh, just one last myth now. Uh, many would say that there was always this friction between Jews and Christians, but do we see before um, this... Uh, you was mean established. Jews and, you mean Jews Jew, and Muslims? Yeah, I'm sorry, Jews and Muslims. Yeah. Uh, were they living in, in peace with each other before the, uh, this, all this came about? Well, the experience of Jews in Arab countries and Muslim countries was very different from the experience that Jews had in, Christi in the Christian world. In the Christian world, Jews were persecuted. And the Nazi Holocaust was, was a part of that, but it certainly wasn't the beginning. And, it was, and you know, this been, was something that was mm -hmm. part of almost European tradition was, to, was, was, uh, was Jewish persecution. This did not exist in the Muslim world. Whenever Jews were, had to flee from Christian countries, they came and were welcomed in, in Arab countries, in Muslim countries. Um, and the Middle East was a place of tolerance, religious tolerance mostly. Only since the establishment of the State of Israel did this myth come up and this friction come up between J Jews and Muslims. Um, but it's something that, is, that was forced upon both Jews and Muslims by Israel and by Zionist ideology, and we see this here in the U.S. today too. The only reason there's this Islamophobia, which is a real issue here in America, it's something that exists, this, this, this fear and this demonizing of Muslims and Arabs, is because of the support for Israel and the, the fact that America has bought into the Zionist narrative. Uh, how can people, if they want to get a hold of you, if they'd like to invite you out to speak more on this, uh, to uh, get your book, watch your presentations, how can they... Uh Get, well, everything's on, the, everything's on the internet. The book is called The General Sun, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. It's available on Amazon, or if they can go to thegeneralsun.com or micopella.com and send me a message. Uh, they can write me an email, micopella.gmail.com. 
I'm always available, always happy to speak and, um, and um, discuss this issue. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us here on The Dean Show. I know it was a short amount of time, but uh, hopefully people can uh, get in contact with you, get your book, and invite you to speak either at a church, a mosque, wherever. You're open to go any, anywhere? Sure, and people should come to this uh, conference here, the A&P conference here in Chicago this weekend. Thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure. Please thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in to The Dean Show. That was the general son giving you the facts, not fiction. And I know this is a very sensitive topic for many people, but there is no anti-Semitism going on here. It's just education, and we want the best for all of mankind. So from here, you can go ahead and investigate this further. Look into it. Subscribe to The Dean Show. Come back here every week. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below.